Windows picks the best times to want to restart. All right, the message is gone. All right, so we're going to find uh, the exact value of, actually, let's do tangent. We did a cosine and sine. We'll do a tangent now of 8 pi over 3. All right, 8 pi over 3. So first of all, that's a lot of thirds. It's not one or two or three thirds. It's eight thirds, a lot of thirds. Is this more than 2 pi? So that's an easy question to answer if you know 2 pi as 6 pi over 3. We think in thirds, OK, definitely more than 6 pi over 3. So let's think about where 8 thirds will be. So unit circles right there. 8 pi over 3, we're counting in thirds. So instead of labeling this as pi, I'm going to label it as 3 pi over 3. If I go all the way around, I will have 6 pi over 3 right there. So that would be one full lap around a unit circle, 6 pi over 3. And then I need to go another 2 thirds, or 2 pi over 3 more. So I th hopefully we didn't do 2 pi over 3. No, we didn't. OK, good. So we haven't done this exact angle yet. So there's 6 pi over 3. Now, I don't want to go quite to another 3 pi over 3. I want to go 2 pi over 3. So I think we have cut it up like this before. That's 1 pi over 3. And this one will be 2 pi over 3 right there. So I cut the, the full 3 pi over 3. So I cut this 3 pi over 3 into 3 pieces. So I got pi over 3, pi over 3, and another pi over 3. So we want to think in pi over 3s, and things won't be so bad. Now to draw this angle out properly, we did a full lap. So to do that, I'm going to draw this sort of spiral arrow like this. Because this spiral arrow, I can see we did a full lap, and then we did another uh, 2 pi over 3 more. So that'll be our 8 pi over 3 right there. Now labeling sort of a pain. I'll squeeze in the, uh, I guess we'll fill that in 8 pi over 3 right there, so we'll label that angle. <clears throat> so in the blue marker, I will do all of our measurements. So we want to measure what is the distance to the x-axis. So how much rotation, how much more rotation do I need to go from my angle I want back to the x-axis over here? So I'll just pi over 3. So that should be, because we're in thirds, it's relatively easy to see. If we weren't in thirds, I'd have to probably do some common denominators and all that stuff. So we got pi over 3 right here. And what I need to do is measure pi over 3 in the regular way. So we're just going to go right here. This blue angle is pi over 3 measured starting where I should start. So that's the pi over 3, the regular pi over 3. So you do not have a quiz today. So it means it could be Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. So one question on your quiz is, what's the first quadrant unit circle? And what value do I put for this pi over 3 right here? What x value do we have here? Anybody start memorizing? 1 half. And what is our y value? Oh, there we go. Square root 3 over 2. All right, so that's the quadrant one point. What changes when I move to the black point, the one I actually want? What coordinate becomes negative, x or y? So our x can become negative. So y, I'll just copy that. Square root 3 over 2, x is negative 1 half. All right, and that is, we see our cosine and our sine. Always cosine first, cosine is x, sine is y. So this will be cos 8 pi over 3, comma, sine 8 pi over 3. Now, whenever you see uh, 
two, uh, a point being equal to another point, which is what we have here. We got one point equals another point. There's really two equations hiding in there. There's an x equation, there's a y equation. So the x equation is cos 8 pi over 3 equals negative 1 half. And then the y equation is sine 8 pi over 3 equals square root 3 over 2. And all I did for this, we just want to match that cosine. The first coordinate needs to equal the other first coordinate. And then the second coordinate needs to equal the other second coordinate. So it's just two point is equal means both parts have to be equal. The x and the y have to be equal. All right, we don't want cosine or sine. We want tangent, though. So our original question is what's tangent? So tangent a pi over 3 is going to be our y over the x. So we're going to go pick the y, square root 3 over 2, divided by x, negative 1 half. And you can multiply by the reciprocal, or you can multiply by 2 over 2. Might be a little bit quicker, or maybe a little less writing. So 2 cancels the 2, that 2 cancels that 2, and we just have square root 3 over negative 1, which is just negative square root 3. So that is our tangent of 8 pi over 3 that we were originally Oh, that's really small. All right, we'll write it big here. Square root three, negative square root three. All right, questions on any of those ideas? So that's basically the end of 10. Oh, I should really be consistent. Man, a lot of zooming for the notes. All right, I'll try to be more careful in the next section. All right, so this is 10.2. We're about to go to 10.3. And 10.3, this is identities. Identities. So before I start talking about identities, all right, so this is your brain right here. So let's talk about your brain and how you learn. So this graph, this is time on this axis, and on the vertical one is understanding. or comprehension, or whatever fancy word you want to write there. And over time, if a topic is hard for you at the beginning, you're going to understand it very little. So you, if you've never seen it before, you actually start right here at the origin. For example, you've never seen cosine before, so you didn't know what cosine was until I told you. So you're generally going to start somewhere near the origin when I first introduce a topic. And then what's going to happen is, slowly, you're like, oh, OK. I sort of think I know about cosine. I at least know a definition, and I've seen a couple examples. Uh, and then at some point, you're going to be learning quite a bit. And then after enough time, you'll know quite a bit about cosine, and you're not going to learn that much more by continuing to study cosine, for example. So there's two other important points right here. Now I'm going to draw how you will feel at these different moments. And we'll do a blue marker. So this is how you feel down here. Usually you're frustrated. So when I first talk about something new, you don't understand it. And you have to constantly look back in your notes. Hopefully you can look back and see it's in some box somewhere. But you're constantly having to look back and forth. and. Uh, you can't just answer questions right off the top of your head. Once, uh, at some point, you're going to start to remember enough about some of the properties of cosine that you won't have to keep looking back in your notes. And you're going to get better and better at you know, the questions and the homework 
Uh, if you look back at the notes, they'll make more sense over, over time. And as this is happening and you're answering homework questions correctly, usually you're relatively happy right here. So you're starting to understand things. Things are making sense. You're getting questions right. You're not having to spend an hour or two on questions. Uh, you're going to get answer questions in five minutes or less at some point. Um, and that's when you're somewhere near the top up here. Um, and usually will, not everybody gets super happy. Uh, if you're a math, a real math geek, you probably actually, this is your face right here as you're learning. Uh, if you're just here because it's a required class, your smile's probably not so big. Uh, but I think you understand at least the point. Now at some point, if I give you too many homework problems, or you're studying for your exam and you really know this topic well, you're going to get bored at some point. You're going to be able to look at the question and already know how to answer it without really using your brain very much. Your brain's just going to see it and be like, I got it. At that point, if you keep answering questions, you're actually going to be bored because you're not, this is not new anymore. You're just going back and answering things you already know about. So at that point, you are, you're not frustrated anymore, but you're just bored. So you need to, and everybody is going to take a different amount of time to go from frustrated to where you can learn quickly. And then this learning quickly takes different time for different people. And even for the same person, different topics, you're going to learn some things real quick. If you're a visual person, things like reference angles, you're going to pick up real fast. Uh, but maybe you're not an algebra person, so algebra might take a lot more effort. So depending on who you are, this may be uh, steep or it may not be very steep. But either way, you'll know how you're feeling as you're learning. The idea is for hopefully for quizzes, but definitely for midterms, you want to have as many topics as you can up here in the board phase because you've done enough homework problems, you studied enough that you can just see, uh, you know what tangent of 8 pi over 3 is or at least you know exactly how to do it. You're not worried about that problem. And the idea is before your midterm, you want to have as many topics well understood as you can. So you're basically, as you're reviewing things for your midterm, you want to get to the point where you're bored, not because you uh, don't like math or don't, like, don't want to sit down at the time, but because you already know how to answer all those types of questions. So if you're really well prepared and you look at the midterm review, and you can answer almost every question right away, chances are you're going to ace your midterm after that. If you look at your midterm review uh, a week before your midterm and you are down here at the frustrated level, you're going to have quite a bit of work to do if you want to do well in your midterm. So the idea is use your homeworks to, your homeworks are what gets you up this curve right here. So the more time, the more effort you put into your homeworks, uh, the better you're going to do on your midterm. Quizzes are a little different because quizzes, you don't have that so much time. So you're going to find when quizzes hit, you're probably going to be somewhere in this blue zone right here. With your quizzes, you want to try to be up, hopefully higher up on the blue when the quiz hits. But chances are, there's going to be a few quizzes that you're going to be a superstar and you might feel right up here on the quiz if you're really good at those topics. Maybe you're awesome at algebra and quizzes that focus on algebra, you're going to be able to just, you know, destroy those quizzes. So some quizzes you're going to be up here in the board section. Hopefully you don't have too many quizzes where you're down here in the frustrated, I don't understand section. Now this is not something that I can help you. So my job is to, I'll put the red down here. My job is to get you out of here. So I'll write Carlson right there, and that's you. So it's my job to get you out of the red. It's your job to get yourself through the blue. And you get up high as up on the blue as you can. Hopefully you're into the black uh, by the time your midterm hits. So if you, things are not making sense in class, down here you're in the red. You need to make sure you're asking questions, whether it's to me. Uh, you can look, you can read your book, you can look on YouTube, you can rewatch lectures, but hopefully I can get you out of the red zone during class. If I can't, uh, if you're consistently in the red zone in class, that's when you want to come and talk to me in my office hours or after class and say, how can I, I feel like I'm, 
you know, in the frustrated zone uh, every single class all the time. So hopefully at the end of class, you are somewhere near the bottom of the blue, somewhere right around there. And the more time you spend on homework, the further up on the blue you're going to get. And only you know when you're going to go from learning to not really learning much anymore because you already know it. So that's your job is climbing up the blue. Generally, the more time and effort you put into your homework, the better you're, the further up on the blue you're going to get. Now, there are going to be some topics that are really tough for you, and I may not give you enough homeworks. So maybe I only give you enough homeworks so you feel like you get to here. You're somewhere in the middle of the blue, and you ran out of web work questions. How can you climb the rest of the way out of the blue? You can what? You can redo the problems. That's one option. Um, but if you redo them, if it's pretty soon after you did them the first time, you'll probably, you may not learn that much because it's the exact same problem. Uh, where else can you go for problems? Textbook. textbook. <clears throat> and I believe every single answer in the, is in the textbook. So every question they ask, they have all the answers in there. They don't show work for the answers, so you'll have to do that. So you want to decide if, when you're done with your web work, if you don't feel like you have climbed up into the board zone, you want to go and pick problems out of your book to do. So you want to decide, look through your book, and when you're looking at homework problems from your book, don't do the ones that you can look at and do already. You're like, oh, I can get, I know every, I do every problem in this, in this little section here in my book, but maybe I look down to the next section and that's where I'm having trouble. So don't spend time doing problems. You don't want to spend time up here. You want to know when you're up here and then pick a different section or a different topic where you're down here in the blue. So you want to spend all your time in the blue down here. So it's kind of like a game where you have to know when you're in the black and when you're in the black you stop doing Hopefully you are finish your homework when you're in the black. If not, sometimes you have to do some homework problems and you'll be bored. I and mean, that's just the way it goes. I can't pick the perfect number of homework problems for everybody. So sometimes I don't give you enough homework at something you're really good at, or I give you too much homework and you're already mastered it well before the end of the homework and you just be bored answering some homework questions. And that's just the way things go. But you need to understand when you have finished your homework and you still don't feel like you mastered it. It's your job to go and find extra problems to do after that. Uh, you do not control directly how you do on quizzes and exams. All you can really control is how much effort you spend preparing for your quiz and your exams. So it's your job to get up as high as you can on this curve before your next quiz, your next midterm. So you already know a quiz question. Can you redraw that first quadrant of the unit circle? It was an easy yes or no question. So after class, can you redraw it? If it's yes, you probably don't need to study it anymore. If it's no, well, that's one thing you need to study. <clears throat> All right, so that is your brain overall. Uh, another thing is your homework score is usually going to be within 10% of your grade in the class. So I think I talked about this the first day. So you want to think about what grade do you want. If you want to get a 4.0, you need your homework score to be pretty close to 90%. Um, there'll be a few of you that you'll be 20 or 30 percent away from your homework score and your grade in the class and if that's the case you probably already know who you are some people are going to get 95 percent on the homework and maybe get a c in the class and some people are going to get 50 percent of the homework and still walk out with a b in the class those there's probably only one two or three of you in this room and if it's you you shouldn't know who you are and if it's not if you're thinking maybe it's me it's probably not you probably somebody else. Uh, but most of you, you want to pick a grade you want, and then all you can do is get your homework score as close as you can to that percentage, and hopefully get it above that percentage. OK, so this has nothing to do with identities. This is just your brain and how to learn. So let's get to actual identities. So here are the uh, basic identities.
So let's rewrite. Another really good way to memorize things is to rewrite it. And typing doesn't really uh, help your memory. Only really writing it out by hand helps your memory. So let's rewrite our cos theta equals x, sine theta equals y, tan theta y over x, and our reciprocals, sec theta 1 over x, cosecant theta 1 over y, and cotangent theta will be x over y. So we already looked at these, so what I'm going to do is draw a cloud around them because you may not have memorized these already, but this is not the place. Uh, I don't want to put it in a box because we have it in a box in the previous section. All right, so this is just review right here. So our identities are going to all come from these properties. So let's look at cosecant uh, and cosine. That would be the first two, the first row there. So how are they related? They're similar. They're both having x in them. And I can even write this as x over 1 if I want to. Divided by 1 doesn't do anything. So how are these two related? They're reciprocals. So that's our first identity. We'll go with cosecant, or actually secant, theta equals 1 over cos theta. So that's our first identity. We can do the exact same thing with sine and cosecant. So with the y's there, y and 1 over y. So we have cosecant is 1 over sine theta. Secant, cosecant, and then we have co. We'll do the same thing for cotangent. And cotangent, 1 over tangent. Draw better theta. All right. The uh, next three we're going to write down. I'm going to relate uh, tangent. If we look back up here, tangent's y over x. How can I relate tangent to sine and cosine? Let me erase this over one. How can I relate tangent to sine and cosine? Sine over cosine. That's exactly right. So tangent is y over x, so y is sine, x is cosine, so tangent theta is sine theta over cosine theta. So that's one way to write tangent. Uh, I can do the same thing for cotangent. Cotangent is just the reciprocal, so that is cos over sine theta. So these are our basic identities right here. These will be a lot easy to, easier to remember if you remember the definitions of these six functions. If you can get the definitions written down, uh, maybe you forgot if tangent sine over cosine or cosine over sine. That's pretty easy to forget which way it goes. But if you know tangent's y over x and you know sine is y, you can figure out which one you should be working with. So you know, the better you learn the definitions, your identities just fall right out of the definitions. At least these ones do. Ah, one more. Well, I'll put this in a separate section. Oh, let's get back to your brain really quickly. So let's say that uh, some tips for getting out of the red during class. So you are hanging out in the red zone right here. Maybe you feel like you're leaving class, and that's you right there, that point. And that's you a lot. What happens if you start using your phone in class a bunch? What do you think, how do you think that affects going through this red curve? Yeah, you're basically just tying your shoes together and trying to run. Every, whatever, five minutes, you're looking at your phone and forgetting what we just did. So you really want to have your 
phone either off or at least on silent and away. Uh, another thing to do, so you want to make sure you pay, basically pay as much attention as you can, is your job in class to try to get through the red. So I can't make you pay attention. I try to tell you things that are useful and uh, not sound too boring. I am teaching math class, so that's a serious challenge. Uh, not the useful part, but the boring part. So it's my job to hopefully help you pay attention, but I can't make you pay attention. And so you want to minimize your distractions right here. If, you're, if you want your textbook out during class, if you're a textbook out type of person, strongly recommend you buy the textbook. So you have a paper textbook out. Your textbook's not going to vibrate unless there's some ghost in here or something. So your textbook's not going to distract you in the way that your phone or your tablet might, or your laptop might distract you if you have that open. So you really want to minimize distractions if you can get part way up the blue during class, you're going to just go to your homeworks and destroy them really quickly. It'll be uh, way faster for you. So you have way more time to go play PlayStation or whatever you want to do. Uh, so the further up on this curve you can get in class, the better off your life's going to be. You can text somebody back LOL after class, trust me. You got 10 minutes for your next class. Uh, same thing is true while you're climbing up the blue curve. What happens if you are watching um, What's the show people watch? Game of Thrones? Breaking Bad? Whatever you're, whatever you're into. What happens if you uh, have Breaking Bad on uh, while you're doing your math homework? What do you think happens to this blue curve? It's going to, it's going to be a lot less steep. And if it's something really good like Breaking Bad, this curve might actually get flat. And at that point, you should stop doing your work and start watching Breaking Bad because your math is just going to uh, clutter up the room. So you want to decide, what are you doing? Are you watching something or are you chatting with your friends or are you doing your homework? So you really want to maximize all these curves right here. Uh, when you're in the board zone and, you're doing, and, you're, and I forced you to do too many homework problems, that's a different story. If you're bored, it doesn't really matter what you're doing at that time. You could probably multitask if you're completely comfortable doing those homework problems. So you need to know when you're in the blue. When you're in the blue, no distractions. When you're in the black, not very important what you're doing. You just got to make sure you finish your homeworks just for the points that you're going to get for having a higher homework score. Because homework is, I think, 20%. Is that right? Whatever it says on the syllabus, we saw it. Somewhere about 20%. So getting a higher homework score directly impacts your grade, uh, not just your understanding. So you really want to maximize the steepness of these curves. And the best way to do that, make sure you got no distractions. What happens if you come here tired and you can barely keep your eyes open? Probably not going to learn much, right? So if you're tired, this is going to be you down here during class. And then you are going to have to be responsible for getting to that point right there. So you're going to probably have to come back. You're going to have to watch the lecture on YouTube, ask your friends, go to the tutor center. You're going to have to spend your own time outside of class trying to pick up the slack you didn't do in class. So if you come here tired, sometimes you have to, um, but you want to minimize the amount of time you come here tired. So you're going to come here tired. Same thing if you come here hungry. You're hungry the whole time, you have the same exact problem. So it's your job to maximize all these curves. And the further you go in math, the harder things get. Hopefully, I'm scaring you with the Calculus 3. So believe me, Calculus 3 is no joke. Uh, you really need to work hard in Calculus 3 if uh, you're going to understand it at somewhere up near the uh, high level up here. So the further you go, if you're going into you know, serious science classes, and you want to go through organic chemistry, you're going to feel the same way in organic chemistry. It's going to be really tough. Uh, maybe you did really well in Chem you know, 161, but by the time you hit whatever organic chemistry is, you're, everybody works hard in that class. So we'll do our first example, and it will reference all these identities. So every time I write example, EX, that is going to be a problem that could be very similar to a quiz or a midterm question. So examples are similar to what I will ask you and grade you on.
given sine theta equals square root 5 over 5. Oh, it's rationalized. And tan theta equals 1 half. Find cosine theta. <clears throat> so we want to find cosine theta. In this problem, we don't actually have to know what theta is. I can probably narrow it down to a couple quadrants, but I don't actually need to know what theta is. What I want is what is the cosine of theta. So I want to know what is the cosine of theta. So how are sine, tangent, and cosine all related together? So we got our tan, so our tans are y over x, which is sine over cosine, and that equation relates all three uh, sine, cosine, and tangent together. So I'm going to use that upper right equation right there. So we're going to begin with what we know. So we know that tangent theta equals sine over cosine. So we know tangent sine over cosine. We know sine and we know tangent, but what I want to do is find cosine. So I want to solve for cosine. So I'm going to solve for cos theta. So what algebra do I do to solve for that denominator on the right side? I can do it probably in two moves. So I multiply by what? Cosine. So we'll do that. So we have cos theta tan theta equals sine theta. And last step. Divide by tangent. So we have cosine equals sine over tangent. We know sine, we know tangent, so all we're going to do is plug these uh, values in, and we're going to get cosine right away. Now, as for uh, algebra, this is not an algebra class. We'll definitely use algebra, but I won't directly uh, teach you algebra. So if I don't show enough work, please ask questions. So if you're wondering how do we get from step one to step two, uh, I'm more than happy to go and write that we're going uh, times cos theta. So that's how we got from step one to two. And how do we go from two to three? We set it, we divide by tangent. So I'm going to write multiply one over tan theta. And that's how we got down to step three. So if I don't show enough intermediate steps, please ask. You know, if you don't see how do we go from step one to two, you are not the only person who has that question. There is more than there's 35 or so people in here. Believe me, probably about a third of the class will have the exact same question you will. Now, it's a different story if you're not paying attention. Uh, and then you ask a question like, what is cosine theta? Uh, so make sure if you have questions, especially on algebra steps, um, how do we do that? Uh, I also make mistakes on purpose to make sure you're paying attention. So all my mistakes are done on purpose to uh, make sure that you are paying attention. So please, if you see them, correct them. And because this goes on YouTube, you can correct me and that will live forever. So you can correct me 50 times this quarter if you pay attention probably. Okay, so cosine, we're just gonna plug in all of our values now. Cos theta equals our sine, make sure you plug sine on, in on the top and tangent on the bottom. So we have square root five, over 5 divided by 1 half. And you can use some extra parentheses so you know numerator from denominator. And multiply. In this case, I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal because they don't have the denominators are 5 and 2. There's not really a good common one to, to use here. So we have 2 square root 5 over 5. If you're really anti-rationalizing, you could unrationalize, which I don't necessarily recommend. I recommend when you get a numeric answer that's relatively simple, just leave it. So if you want to unrationalize, it should be 2 over square root 5, like that. So you'd multiply by square root 5 over 5 and then reduce. 
So I'm going to circle that answer as our, uh, the one we should probably use. I think I stole this problem from a textbook, not your textbook, but uh, one we used before, and they were rationalizing in there, which I disagree with, but oh well. So one more, before we continue on to more trigonometry, uh, one more thing about homeworks. I don't think I mentioned this, but we just started 10.3. So what that means is we just finished 10.2. We're going to go in numerical order overall. So that means you should be able to do, at least attempt, all of your 10.2 homeworks by this point. So you should already be either finished all of your 10.1 or mostly finished with all of your 10.1 questions. Any of your 10.1 questions you can't finish that you're having trouble with, you want to ask on Canvas. There's discussion for, I think, 10.1 through 10.4 is all grouped together. So make sure you're asking your questions in that section. Um, I know students a lot of times have trouble with the clock question where you have to go, I think, into hours. You have to measure angle in hours. Um, I'll give you a hint. One rotation is 12 hours. So that's one big thing you need for that. And you just look at fractions of how, much of a, how many hours do you have. You know, same thing with minutes. 60 minutes is one rotation. Uh, so that question can trip people up. So make sure you're uh, asking questions on Canvas. And then make sure that you're checking Canvas occasionally when, especially when you ask questions on Canvas, go and see if you can answer anybody else's questions. Because chances are somebody else has asked a question that you probably just finished. So you might be able to answer their question as well. And uh, you also want to read the questions because you don't want to ask the same question somebody else just asked. So if you're going to ask the exact same one somebody else asked, that's a little silly. You can, I mean, sometimes that'll happen. Don't worry about it too much. But you don't want to do that all the time. So you want to hopefully make uh, different questions, you know, write up different questions up there. Uh, and they don't have to limit it. You can also, uh, you know, if you want to talk about something I did in class or a question from the book, it doesn't have to be limited to web work. You can go, you know, oh, I'm working on this book problem. How do I, you know, how in the world do I figure out this, this thing? And, you know, just what page and what question number is it? So don't be afraid to use your book book questions and quizzes so we just finished 10 2 yesterday no we finished 10 2 today so the way I do quizzes is I give you two full days before I'll give you a 10 2 quiz so we finished 10 2 today you should go and do your 10 2 homeworks tonight you may have started them last night and that's that's very reasonable but you want to uh, do your 10 2 as much 10 2 homeworks tonight as you can so you can ask questions on Canvas and uh, finish, hopefully, your 10-2 questions tomorrow as much as you can so you're ready for a quiz the next day. So two days after I finish a section is when I could give you your pop quiz. So you don't know what day the quiz is, but you do know what day I finish sections. So in your notes, if you want to go back to your 10-2 right here, uh, somewhere you could write possible. 10.2 quiz. So we finished it today, which is Tuesday, the, what's the date? 10th. Okay. So 10, 11, 12, so, which will be Thursday. So if I give you a quiz Thursday, you know it's going to be covering 10.2, and everything is cumulative, so it's 10.2 and 10.1. So on Thursday, I can give you a 10.2 quiz. If I give you a quiz tomorrow, it can't cover 10-2, so it would just be a 10.1 quiz. So tomorrow, be ready for a 10-1 quiz. Thursday, you need to be ready for a 10-2 quiz. I don't think I'm going to finish 10-3 today, uh, so I don't think you need to worry about a 10-3 quiz until next week. But whenever we finish 10-3, in your notes, you can write down the day we finish it, which means two days later. You have to use your brain a little bit if it's Friday and we finish it. You have to go Monday, and then Tuesday will be the possible quiz. So. It always goes by class days. Actually, we don't have a Monday. I think we're off Monday. So next week you start on Tuesday. So you can always just count two classes ahead after we finish. So I'm not going to write that down. That's something that you can do. But that is a very good idea to keep track of uh, when 
uh, or what sections that could be on the quiz coming up. So you can make sure that you can answer, hopefully, most of the 10-2 questions by Thursday. So I don't know what you don't know, only you know what you don't know. So it's up to you to learn that. So this is our basic identity example. Let's look at what are called the Pythagorean identities. So Pythagorean identities, why do they come from the Pythagorean theorem? Let's think about any point on the unit circle. So that'll be theta. So our point on the unit circle, if we got a theta, it will be cosine comma sine. That'll be our x, y. All right, equation for the unit circle. We saw that already. I think probably second day of class, maybe first day of class, something like that. It was x squared plus y squared equals 1 squared. So that's our unit circle equation. And we know 1 squared is 1, so we're just going to write it x squared plus y squared equals just regular 1. And this works because if we connect our angle down to the x-axis, remember you're always going perpendicular to the x-axis. So if you're, uh, whatever quadrant you're in, you're drawing a vertical line directly to the x-axis. So x, y, if I uh, redraw this triangle right down here, y is the vertical side. So we got y, we got x, and what is our third side, our hypotenuse? It's 1. So we're on the unit circle, so it's going to be 1. So why is this Pythagorean identity? What theorem relates x, y, and 1? Pythagorean theorem. So that's why it's called Pythagorean identity. You got this triangle. Does it matter exactly what angle theta was? Actually, I should measure theta this way. Does it matter what angle theta is? Or is this true for any point on the unit circle? Any point on the unit circle, no matter what, will satisfy. This equation is always true if you're on the unit circle. So no matter what theta is, you always have x squared plus y squared equals 1. So it's independent of theta. All I'm going to do is just put in cos theta for x and sine theta for y. And we'll do that over here. So there is our Pythagorean identity written out with cosine and sine. Unfortunately, there is some notation that uh, everybody uses in trig. And it is exponential notation. And they write squares or any, any power right next to the function instead of, instead of the way that they should write it. So this, in my opinion, this is better notation. And this notation is common notation. Now when I say common notation, oh, all right. Oh yeah, you can't see the, the stupid projector. Oh no, I see almost all of it. All right, now I say better notation is better for doing algebra, it's better for doing calculus, it's better doing, for doing all math. Unfortunately, common notation is what you're going to see in your textbook, what you're going to see when you watch YouTube videos, what you're going to see when I write things out. So it's what everybody uses. It's kind of like the imperial measurement system. How many ounces in a cup? Not 10 like it should be. So metric system's much better, but for whatever reason, uh, we don't use it. So you're going to see uh, exponential notation written out the way I wrote it right here. So I'm going to put a box around this one. And I'll talk a little more about why this notation is bad tomorrow. <laughs>